here believes that blockchain can shift the paradigm of how live video is done today. Who here has heard of LivePeer? My name is Rafi. I'm the Director of Operations at LivePeer, and I'm going to tell you how LivePeer is shifting the paradigm of video streaming, how IPFS and LivP2P are working with LivePeer to achieve that goal, and a few ideas of how we can work together in the future. So what is LivePeer? LivePeer is open source. It's an open access video infrastructure network. And this is actually really rare in the video world. Most of the technology that video engineers use is closed source and proprietary. Before talking about what LivePeer is and how it's changing the paradigm, it's important for us to visit how video streaming is done today. So, Let's say a broadcaster, it's HBO live streaming boxing from MSG. They're going to send that stream in an RTMP file to a media server. And that media server does transcoding. And this is crucial to send the video to all the viewers in no matter what their networking conditions are or no matter what device they're using. Um, and this is typically done through a closed software provider. And it's extremely expensive. It costs $3 per stream per hour just to deliver this content. So a company like Twitch is spending millions of dollars as an operating expense just to process the content. That doesn't include the CDN piece. So the media server can send it to a DRM for privacy, um, and then they will send that stream to a content delivery network via HLS or Dash. Um, and these CDMs are people like AWS, Akamai, these closed software behemoths. And they are the ones that really run the internet. This is how you deliver content to viewers no matter what the different device is. So how's LivePeer changing this? The broadcaster would send that same live stream via RTMP to a open source network. LivePeer has a vision towards a fully decentralized video stack, but today we're going to focus on the decentralized transcoding network, which is openly accessible, so anyone with compute resources can join and provide compute power. It's dynamically scaling so that you can spin up additional nodes to react to additional live streaming supply. And it, most importantly, it's trustless and anonymous. So how does LivePeer actually work? A transcoder will advertise its capabilities and price on the Ethereum network. Transcoders can do the work at the same time. A broadcaster then sends the job into the network with parameters required on a smart contract. And the smart contract will assign the job to a transcoder. The broadcaster starts pushing the video and signs the video with the, their private key. This says to the world, I'm the publisher of this content. When the transcoder sees the video and the signature, they start doing the work. The transcoder then creates another signature and writes it onto the blockchain that says, hey, I've taken this input and created this output. We don't do this for every segment. We create a Merkle root and write this onto the blockchain. The transcoder writes the result into a video storage, and the broadcaster will use the result to send it to viewers. How does the broadcaster trust that the work is done correctly? When the transcoder writes proofs on chain, the smart contract randomly selects different video segments, and the transcoder has to prove that they are doing the work right. This gets into computation verification, which is really expensive on-chain, so we've been exploring off-chain solutions. We've been working with Truebit and have built a prototype that decentralizes verification so we can execute off-chain and still trust that computation is done correctly. Okay, so this is probably a moment that you all have been waiting for, which is how are we working with IPFS and with P2P? So IPFS feels like this amazing storage network, right? So we know that if we store a file here, someone can access that file using the IPFS hash. And that plays a critical part in how the LivePeer protocol works, because we know that the video will be available when anyone requests it. And with, without IPFS, we wouldn't be able to do this in a decentralized way. LibP2P, on the other hand, is kind of an is the opposite of, an, of black box, and it 
the library enables us to build and solve networking problems. It's how we decide how specific nodes connect to each other, so a broadcaster to a transcoder node or to a gateway node. Um, so let's dig a little bit deeper, looking at the verification to start. So when the smart contract identifies random segments to verify, the transcoder will s upload that segment to IPFS, and that IPFS hash is used um, as the key input in the verification process. Uh, um, the other way that we're using IPFS is as the storage solution, as it one option for the transcoder to upload the fully transcoded video um, for the broadcaster. The way that we are using lib P2P is it's really one of the options that we're using for delivering video. It's a networking library and it is a building block for LivePeer. It sets the, the rules for how broadcasters talk to transcoders or to a gateway node. There's a second way that we could in the future use lib P2P, although we haven't fully built it or implemented it. And this is using um, PubSub as a video CDN. So PubSub lets nodes subscribe to a data stream. And there is a world where a broadcasting node could publish a stream and other nodes could subscribe to those streams. And so we could use this as a decentralized CDN. Here are three things that we need that you all can help with. Number one, latency and benchmarking testing. So in a peer-to-peer -peer network, it's important for us to have visibility into the reliability and performance of the network, right? And we need to be able to measure that in a controlled simulated environment. We want to know how to quantify emergent behaviors that come up in different formations of different networking formations. Um, we want to be able to measure latency and how network congestion affects the latency of a video stream. And a second way that we could work together is replicating data across the IPFS network. So today, when a viewer requests a video, they don't know how long it's going to take to find that video and to request it. So there is an opportunity to maybe specify potential viewers who are likely to consume a video, and that video could be distributed and pre-cached to their node. Lastly, there's an idea around geolocation as a proxy for a viewer experience. So if you could see, as a viewer, a list of peers close to me, it gives me a, no no a, no a notion of latency and how, how my experience is going to be. So why lib P2P? There's a, a dozen reasons that I could talk about, but I really want to focus on the key reason why we chose lib P2P. And that's because it's cross-platform. It works both in the back end and in the browser. And theoretically, they should all be able to talk to each other using this common interface. And we're excited that web-based applications, dApps like LivePeer TV, which is one way that people can consume um, live peers, live streams, um, can talk not just to a node on my computer, but a node on your computer or a node on your computer. And often you see peer-to-peer applica -peer applications where one web browser can talk to another web browser, like Peer5, which is a peer-to-peer -peer CDN, and that's cool. But what's really cool is if my web browser can talk to a node running on the command line. And this is the promise that really drew us. And that promise has not been completely fulfilled, and that's partly because of how difficult it is currently to implement. So we talked about why lib P2P. I want to take a couple minutes and talk about a few challenges that we've had, and none of this is new. Our engineering team works really closely with a, a group of folks here, um, and we all, I think, have really enjoyed working together. Um, I surveyed our team just to get a kind of high-level summary, and it's all around developer usability. usability. And this is really important, not just for LivePeer for, for you all, but for any, um, 
any protocol that you're working with, if all of these different projects are thinking about decentralization, you can't just, it's not just onboarding our own internal teams to get up to speed quickly, it's people who are coming in and out of the live peer network as contractors and we wanna make sure that they're able to, to get up to speed fast. And it's been difficult because there's 100 libraries and there's missing documentation and it's, it, upgrading can be painful. Um, again, none of this is new, but I wanted to summarize it here. Um, so if I want to leave you all with anything, it is uh, this cross-platform capability as a guiding light. Um, it's a huge source of potential for folks in this room. If you can get this working well and easy to use, I think it'll spur a lot of adoption because you're gonna, in a web 3.0 world, there will be dApps that live in the web browser and you're gonna have all of these protocols and if you want um, dApps in the web browser to be able to participate as first class citizens in these networks, um, then, and be able to communicate with these protocols that have their own nodes that are, you know, heavy binaries that sync data from the blockchain, um, Cross-platform is really the only solution forward. And I think if you focus on developer usability as kind of a guiding light here, you're gonna see a lot of early adoption with libp 2 p um, I ended earlier, because I probably spoke faster than I did when I was practicing, but thank you very much, and I am happy to take any questions about live peer, um, I can't speak super closely about the implementation of the P2P because I'm not on the engineering team. But with that, I'll take any questions.